Galatians chapter 1 this morning. In the New Testament, Galatians chapter 1. We began looking at this book last week. I want to continue our study in these opening verses. Today we will read verses 6 through 10 of chapter 1 and focus especially on verse 6. So Galatians chapter 1. Brothers, sisters, this is the word of God. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people... I would not be a servant of Christ. Amen. This is God's word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, open our ears now to hear your word, your voice speaking in the scriptures. Fill me with the spirit. Bless us to have spiritual understanding. Take us beyond though the simple words of men. May the explanation today be the, the expression, the accurate explanation of your word. And may your spirit give us wisdom to understand and apply, and the ability to respond to this word rightly. Without you, we can do nothing. As Peter says in the opening verses of his letter, you, you are the one who brought us to life, caused us to be born again. Do that for us through the word. You, you slay us through your law. You bring us to life through your gospel. Do that for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said last week, we began looking at Paul's letter to the Galatians. This was a group of Christian churches who, according to Paul, began well, but now they were compromising the truth. Paul says in chapter 5, verse 7, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? More specifically, he asked them in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? When you read statements like that and others in the book of Galatians, you can begin to put together this picture that the Galatian Christians, after believing the gospel as Paul preached it to them, on his first missionary journey, they later came under the influence of false teachers. And these false teachers were insisting that the Galatians accept circumcision, that they adopt certain aspects of the Mosaic law, and that they do this in order to be saved. Their message was similar to what we read in Acts 15.1. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses. You cannot be saved. I'll say more about that message in just a moment. But in today's passage, in verse 6, you probably notice Paul says that kind of teaching is actually another gospel. He goes on to say it's, it's not really another gospel at all. It's a perversion of the gospel. And he is astonished that the Galatians would embrace it. Look again at the flow of verses 6 and 7. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, turning away from the one who called you and turning unto a different gospel. But then he clarifies, but it's really no gospel at all. There, there's not an option of various true gospels. It's really just no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert 
the gospel of Christ. These false teachers, and we'll call them Judaizers, that's the common name for these false teachers. Evidently, they're coming in and they're, they're presenting their teaching as a supplement to the gospel or something that would complete the gospel. The Galatians don't have the full gospel message. In fact, they may even be accusing Paul of watering down the Christian gospel. Paul's made it too easy, they say. He's changed his message in order to win converts. And Paul has to come back and say, no, they are the ones that are adding to the gospel, perverting the gospel. Their message is no gospel at all. And throughout his letter, by the way, he'll try to prove why he's the one who's right and they're the ones who are wrong. But his concern is that their teaching is confusing the Galatians. It's troubling them. Now, who were these false teachers? Why did they do this? Why did they infiltrate the Christian community with these additional teachings and requirements? Well, we have to base our profile, again, on this letter. We have to look at what Paul says and try to figure out who these people were and what they were saying. They appear to be Jewish Christians, not unbelieving Jews, but Jewish Christians. And they are compelling the Galatians, as we've already said, to accept circumcision, to accept certain aspects of the Mosaic law. And the reason we say they're Christians not unbelieving Jews, but actually Jewish Christians, is because throughout the letter, Paul never has to argue about who Jesus is. He never has to dispute whether or not Jesus is the Messiah or the Lord or whether or not Jesus rose from the dead, whether or not Jesus is God, the big stumbling blocks normally to the Jewish community. Those issues are not in play. What he does have to argue about is whether or not Gentiles must first become Jews in order to be Christians. That's what these Judaizers are saying. They, they view the gospel as something that allows Gentiles to enter the Jewish community. They see the Jewish community as continuing to be the expression of God's people. And what Jesus has done is he's come along, he's made a way for the Gentiles to enter the Jewish community through believing in Jesus Gentiles can join the Jewish people of God. Rather than looking at what Jesus does and taking Jew and Gentiles and forming them into one group of people, the church, or as Paul will call it, the Israel of God. Instead, they say that one must first become a Jew and believe in Jesus in order to be saved. Now, why would they insist on that? Where would we, they get that message from? What would motivate it? Well, try to put yourself in their shoes. They may have felt that their identity was being threatened. Think about it. These are the Jewish people, and they have circumcision, the festivals, the dietary laws, the temple, all the practices that define who they are as the people of God, things that God himself had ordained. But now they have reached the point in God's story where they've been fulfilled. And those symbols are passing away. And maybe that struggle, that transition there is tempting them to say, no, let's keep this Christian movement anchored in the historic Jewish community. Let's have Jewish Christianity and keep it in that mold. It may also have been that these Judaizers were experiencing harassment. Keep in mind, they're Jews. They're trying to believe, bring Gentiles into the Jewish community. But the unbelieving Jews are not going to want to accept that. Jews and Gentiles don't mix in the ancient world. And so it might be a lot easier to pass these Gentiles off if they would accept the Jewish rites, if they would be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. To say that they could come in as Gentiles would put much more persecution, much more harassment on these Jewish believers. And so maybe they're just trying to lower the steam. Maybe they're just trying to make things a little easier, smooth over the community by having these Gentile Christians undergo these practices. Whatever, whatever the motive, good, bad, ugly, whatever it might have been, Paul sees the message as a threat. That compromises the identity of the gospel. If you must keep the law 
and believe in Christ. If you have to do anything in addition to believing in Christ, then his death is not adequate. If he did not bear the curse in his own body, then he cannot provide righteousness for sinners. If we have to do anything to finish it, then what he did is not good enough. And so what Paul will tell them throughout this letter is you need to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ. He's going to put it in front of them over and over again. We said that last week. What is God's message for us, that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done in order to rescue us from destruction. We will hear that echoed over and over again throughout this letter. What about us? Why might we need to hear that message today? Why would we, years later, in a different part of the world, need to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ? Because there's false gospels with us today, just as there were false gospels then. For example, there's the gospel of political salvation. Vote for this or that candidate in our party, and all of our problems will be solved. Everything will be fixed in our nation if we just elect this person or that party. And listen, you can be a Democrat, or you can be a Republican. You will find every part of the spectrum people making nearly messianic promises that no person, that no party, that no government could ever fulfill. And yet we're tempted to do that in order to gain some kind of favor or some kind of safety in our lives. Then there's the prosperity gospel, a twisted version of Christianity that promises earthly health and wealth in addition to your spiritual well-being. Kosti Him, he's the nephew of renowned preacher Benny Him. And in an article on Christianity Today's website, he describes traveling when he was a teenager with his uncle nearly twice a month. And he writes, prosperity theology paid amazingly well. We lived in a 10,000-square-foot mansion guarded by a private gate, drove two Mercedes-Benz vehicles, vacationed in exotic destinations, and shopped at the most expensive stores. On top of that, we bought a $2 million Ocean View home in Dana Point, California, where another Benz joined the fleet. We were abundantly blessed concerning the gospel, he writes, though Jesus Christ was still a part of our gospel. He was more of a magic genie than the king of kings. Rubbing him the right way by giving money and having enough faith would unlock your spiritual inheritance. God's goal was not his glory, but our gain. His grace was not to set us free from sin, but to make us rich. The abundant life he offered wasn't eternal. It was now we lived the prosperity gospel. He tells about one particular ministry trip where they stayed at the Grand Resort Laganisi. And he writes, boasting my own ocean view villa, complete with private pool and over 2,000 square feet of living space, I perched on the rocks above the water's edge and rejoiced in the life I was living. After all, I was serving Jesus Christ and living the abundant life he promised. Little did I know that this coastline was part of the Aegean Sea, the same body of water the Apostle Paul sailed while spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was just one problem. We weren't preaching the same gospel as Paul. And he goes on in the rest of the article to talk about how through studying the word of God, he was converted and he was led out of the prosperity gospel. He now pastors a Bible church in California. And one of the points he makes in the article is that in the prosperity gospel, sometimes you have unsuccessful healing attempts. People come and they're not made well. And all the preachers would explain, well, it was the sick person's fault for doubting God. They didn't have enough faith. So at the end of the day, what is the prosperity gospel? It's just another perverted gospel that tells you, you must do something in order for God to bless you. We could keep going and multiply 
examples. But let me mention just lastly, not only do we have these modern versions of perverted and false gospels, but we have the same problem with us today that Paul battled in Galatians, namely the insistence that you must do something in addition to believing in Jesus in order to achieve a right standing with God. And don't miss this. The people who insist on this do not deny the necessity of faith. But what they maintain is that you must also do work. So they keep faith in the equation. In fact, they'd even say it's primary. But you must also do good works and cooperate with God in order to be saved. This is the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. They teach that justification is a process. You cooperate with God in order to become righteous. And as the charity, as love, is formed in you by the Spirit, and as you do good works, good works that offset the temporal punishment due to you for your sins, so eventually you can merit for yourself and for others the grace needed to obtain eternal life. That's based on statements from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Friends, that's another gospel. Unless we seem to be picking on just those people out there and all their problems, even churches with an orthodox creed or a fundamental confession of faith, we can put so much emphasis on obedience and introduce so many man-made rules that the believer's assurance is all but destroyed. That is not the gospel as Paul first preached it to the Galatians. So because of these false gospels, and because, friends, there's something in us that is tempted to embrace them, because of that, we need to see what Paul says about the true gospel of Jesus Christ. What he's telling us in this passage is that what you need to hear today more than anything else is not a message of prosperity or anything like that. What you need to hear is the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And in these verses, he's going to give us three reasons why. We're going to look at one of those today. The first is this, because of the deceptive attraction of false gospels. False gospels are attractive, and yet they are deceptively so. Look at what he says here in verse 6. He writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, despite the fact that they began well. They embraced the gospel when Paul preached it to them on his missionary journey. It seems that only a short period of time later, these false teachers arrived and led them astray. They're like Israel worshiping the golden calf. Right after God gives the covenant law through Moses, Israel quickly defects and begins to worship the golden calf. Now it is interesting, significant possibly, that notice in verse 6, He does use the present tense. He says, you are turning to a different gospel. Maybe he's implying that their apostasy is still being contemplated. In other words, their defection is not yet complete. These false teachers have come in and they're troubling them. They're confusing them. So now they've got competing messages and the Galatians are just not sure which way to turn. They've begun to embrace this false gospel, but they're really caught in the middle. Now, again, what is it about a false gospel that would have been attractive to them? Why why would any of us want to hear a message, do more, and actually find that attractive? Well, here's how false gospels work. They always offer us something that we think we need. So, for example, the prosperity gospel is attractive because it offers material prosperity, physical well-being. And we all are tempted to think that we need that in order to be happy. Think what we talked about a few weeks ago from the book of Hebrews. Here's a group of Christians who have identified with Christ and his people. They've even suffered for his sake. But the, the, the more pressure and the heavier the heat, they're, they're tempted to start drawing back. 
The more they identify with Christ, the more they suffer. They lose their possessions. They lose their social status. They might suffer bodily harm. They see what might come next. They might die for this faith. And all of a sudden, it's like, no, I can't can't go that far. I can't lose all of that and still get by. We, We think we need our possessions. We think we need our health in order to be happy. But what does the gospel assure us of? That God will satisfy us with himself. That having Christ is worth more and is more satisfying than anything we could get anywhere else. Read through the book of Acts. Look at the times when the disciples are beaten for preaching Christ. And when they're released, what what did they go out? Not rejoicing exclusively that they were released. I'm sure they were happy to be out. But they went out rejoicing, what? That they were able to suffer for his name that God would actually allow them to suffer for him was a point of great rejoicing by the disciples there in the book of Acts. In the book of Philippians, Paul mentions one of his co-workers who, taking the letter back and forth between Paul and the Philippians and other journeys, he had gotten sick almost to the point of death, but then God raised him up. What was happening? There was something worth risking health and prosperity for, and it was the gospel. And having the gospel and even suffering for it satisfied them more in their souls than any earthly prosperity they might have had. You just read the history of the church. Believers testify over and over again that God is sufficient. When they were without money, when they were without health, they still had God. And I wouldn't make light of those trials. They they wear on us. I wouldn't make light of them. What I would try to do is make much of the grace of God that is sufficient for those things. False gospels also offer a similarly physical safety, not just our health or our possessions, but false gospels will offer us physical safety. I said in the introduction that the Judaizers might have been driven to circumcise the Gentile Christians because they thought that might take some of the heat off of them. They're welcoming Gentiles into the Christian community and that wasn't something you did in the, or into the Jewish community. That wasn't something you did in the ancient world. So they can just make the Gentiles become Jews. That'll lessen the pressure. The other gospel makes it easier for them not to suffer. And you know what? The Galatians, they might have felt some social pressure too. Think about it. They're pagans. They're Gentiles. Suddenly they get saved. And in the ancient world, they might very much have been cut off from their family or their society or their work. That still happens in our world in this day. So they're cut off from the Gentile world. And at the same time, they're not Jews. They have no people. They have no one. And perhaps to adopt these practices and thus come into the Jewish community offered them that acceptance, that ability to identify how often are we tempted to change the gospel in order to be accepted by others, to insist in our day on the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, that he is the only way to heaven, that faith in Christ is the only way to heaven. That is not a popular message. Friends, family, coworkers, they may criticize you for holding that view. And do you not feel the pressure at times just to widen the gate? Maybe people can come to Christ through other faiths. They just don't know that they're worshiping Jesus. Maybe the other religions are a legitimate way to go to heaven. Who wants to be the bigot in the room? But it's not bigotry to insist that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He is the only one who's dealt with the problem of our sin. Such thinking also assumes, by the way, people will say, well, who are you to tell someone else that they're wrong? But ironically, when they tell you that, they're telling you that you're wrong for telling other people that they're wrong. We all think that certain things are wrong. What is the standard that determines whether they're right or wrong? Is the gospel true? Because if it is, then it is right to warn others and to tell them of Christ. False gospels also entice us with some kind of human certainty. We, we just want to feel secure through something that we do. There's a certain attraction that rule keeping presents to any person. But what does the gospel call us to do? To trust in something outside of ourselves. To put our trust in the completed 
work of Christ. We, we want to find something we can grab hold on and say, this is why I'm right with God. Because I did this. And, and don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we can't have the assurance of salvation. That's something we should seek. But how does assurance come to us? The Spirit gives us assurance as we seek Christ through the Word of God. And what does the Word proclaim to us? That Christ is a sufficient Savior. Trust in Him alone. We don't ground our assurance in a charismatic or powerful teacher, in a religious tradition, in the mystical attraction of an aesthetically pleasing or historically grounded church. Our assurance is founded in Christ alone as he is revealed in the word. Those are the ways that the false gospels attract us. They they try to give us something we think we need. But I said a moment ago that attraction is deceptive. Why is that? Let me answer that and then we will conclude for today. False gospels are deceptive because they cut us off from the free grace of Jesus Christ. All those other ideas we mentioned in some way cut you off from the grace of Christ. Notice the middle phrase of verse 6. Paul says, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. Let me draw your attention first to that word called. And I'll tell you this, whenever you see the word called in Paul's writings, it always refers to an effective summons. In other words, it is a summons by God that guarantees a response. Sometimes when we imagine God calling people to follow him, God is opening your eyes and enabling you to make a decision. He's putting the ball in your court and you can go one way or the other. When Paul uses the word called, he doesn't mean it like that. He means God calls and we respond with faith. Listen to Romans 8.30. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. It does not say God called everyone or God called many. And for those who responded, he justified them. No, the same group that is predestined is also called. And the same group that is called is also justified. Notice Paul doesn't call us the responders. He calls us the called. And maybe you're thinking, okay, what about Jesus' words? He says in Matthew 22, many are called, but few are are chosen. There's a group where a call goes out, but not everyone responds in faith. You're picking up on the idea that the Bible can use the word called in two ways, a general summons and a special summons. And when you understand that distinction, you see that Jesus is really making the same point as Paul. The call goes out and those who are chosen will respond effectively. And when Paul uses the word called, that's how he uses it, in the same sense that Jesus used the word chosen. Now, here's why I told you all this. Because Paul is telling them, look, I'm I'm amazed that you would desert the gospel of the one who called you. In other words, why would you want to embrace another gospel, a gospel that puts the ball in your court, that grounds your assurance in what you do. Why would you want to hold on to that instead of a gospel that acknowledges even the ability to believe comes from Jesus Christ? The point being, he has done everything that needs to be done in order to be saved. Why would you cut yourself off from that? And that's why I said I'm astonished that you would desert the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. You're called to live in what kind of sphere? Not a sphere of works, but a sphere of grace. You have a divine benefactor. Don't desert him for some form of human slavery. So friend, what false gospels are you wrestling with today? Is it the desire for human acceptance or popularity or friendship? Friendship's a good thing, but is it coming at the expense of faithfulness to the gospel? Are you having a hard time believing that 
Jesus accepts you or God accepts you by faith because of the work of Christ and not anything you do that you can rest in the finished work of Christ. Are you seeking Christ for something other than salvation? Do you think that Christ would perhaps be a means to an end? He'll give you material prosperity or physical health. Or are you seeking him for the salvation of your soul? Because that is what he will do for you. And that is what he gives us because of his finished work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Increase our faith in it, our trust in it, our reliance on it, transform us through the Spirit because of the gospel, grant that we'll be more and more satisfied in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing hymn 89, our great...